Who in here has heard the name, who in here has heard the name Bob Goff? Okay, a lot of you. Who in here has heard the name Donald Miller? Okay, a lot less of you heard the name Donald Miller. Bob Goff is famous and, and well-known because of Donald Miller. Uh, Bob Goff, we know him as an author. Bob Goff is not an author. Bob Goff wrote a book but would not consider himself an author. Um, Bob Goff is a lawyer. Uh, his author friend, Donald Miller, was in community with Bob and wrote several really, really fascinating, really good books uh, and was in community with this lawyer who was living such an unbelievable life with an unbelievable perspective. He said, friend, lawyer, you've got to write a book and just share your stories. And that's Bob Goff who then wrote Love Does and, uh, and went on to, to become known to lots and lots of people. Um, but I just say all that just in reference to Donald Miller. Donald Miller's first book that really hit hit the waves and, and became popular. There's a book called Blue Like Jazz. I'd recommend it. It's a great book. Um, the very beginning of Blue Like Jazz, even the intro to Blue Like Jazz starts like this. He says, I never used to like jazz music because jazz music never resolves. And I didn't like it for that reason. Until I was standing outside of a music club, and he names the, the club, uh, in Portland, and there's a man there playing jazz music on his saxophone. And he watched him for 15 minutes, and the man never opened his eyes. He said, after that, I liked jazz music. Um, he goes on to say, I, I didn't ever like God because God never resolves. Um, but now he's come to appreciate that about uh, God. Um, have you ever seen somebody play an instrument at a level that you just can't fathom? Somebody sits down at the keys and just <laughs> uses the entire keyboard and all 88 keys and up and down, and they can close their eyes and play and just effortless. Um, I, I enjoy playing piano, actually. I cannot do that. Uh, I, I can play some chords just enough to sing along is about all I can do. Um, and what I realize is um, the reason I cannot do that is because I have not taken the time to practice enough to become someone that can do that. Well, why haven't you practiced? You, you enjoy playing piano. I enjoy playing a song I don't enjoy practicing piano. <laughs> um, tonight we're going to have a conversation about the world of spiritual disciplines. Because I think we've often also seen people in their life, like we see an expert musician, somebody who's living a Christian life, that we just, man, I wish I could do that. I wish I had what they have, whatever it is that, that allows them to live the life that they're able to live. Well, and what we see is that it's not much different than the illustration of playing an instrument, is it really comes down to, are you willing to do the practices that allow you to live the kind of life that you desire to live? We're going to have a conversation with, with somebody who has who is a peer of mine, um, but also somebody I've looked up to uh, for a very long time because of his, uh, his engagement in the spiritual disciplines that have led to fruit in his life that is, is one of those lives that I think this is, this is somebody I look up to. Uh, he also just happens to be one of my lifelong closest friends. And, and so I apologize for the selfishness that just wanted to hang out with my friend tonight. Uh, but he's also uh, the preacher of the Memorial Road Church of Christ uh, in Edmond. You guys give a warm park welcome for my friend Phil Brookman. Hello. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. When you were doing the intro, I thought... I should have brought my saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't. Sure. I actually don't play the saxophone at all, but I got, <laughs> I got nervous. Like, did you want me to play? Yes. I yes. I, I don't I want know you how to, to play. I want you to. 
sing. And, <laughs> well, actually, if we, if we wanted to get, um, if we wanted to, to demonstrate something tonight that, that we could, yeah, <laughs> Phil's, so sorry. Phil's battling a cough, and so we'll just bear with him tonight. No, all, all kinds of grace, no worries. Thank you. Um, if we wanted to really <clears throat> demonstrate something that, that we can do at a high level, I, I really wanted to bring a ping pong table on stage. Uh, right. Because among just being a, a very close friend of mine, he's also the best ping pong doubles partner I've ever had, right. and and I don't think we've ever been beaten. And I'm willing to put that on the line with Phil. That's right. Um, if anybody if anybody's interested or curious, uh, there's a and and David, that's even for you. I mean, I, yeah. I've, <laughs> so uh, a lot of you, um, uh, if if you've heard Phil Brookman's name, that's great. But a lot of you have have met Phil Brookman's family already, David Brookman. Uh, is Phil's brother, and and so we are. Uh, there's lots of lots of friendship between uh, Park and Memorial Road, and so uh, for that reason alone, I'm also glad to have you just as a That's as right. a representative of a sister church that we that we love very much. And so your personal connection with this church is obviously pretty deep. Little secret about my brother and, and me, and so I've been preaching now for seven years, just an hour and a half away from here in Edmond, and. Uh, it's kind of no, a lot, not a lot of people know this, but uh, David writes all my sermons, uh, and then he works at Flight Safety during the week, but he cranks them out each evening, and then and then Mitch actually listens to my sermons, and that's where he gets his content. So, <laughs> if you've ever been blessed, you can really just thank that man right there, David Brookman. So thank yeah. you, appreciate it, David. Yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> no, I, I am pretty excited to have. So my that's my wife Mary. Yeah, she your family made the came trip, with you And then that's my dad, Steve. And then David and Nicole have been longtime members at Park. And then my girls are you're, you're, somewhere in the vortex of the, you know, of, of, of the, the of complex this, here. Of this so. campus here, right? Uh, and your daughters are sweet as can be. I, I think I would currently uh, vote for Anna for president if, if, she, She's sweet. if she ran. She's a neat I'd, kid. I would, uh, I'd be all in favor. So um, if you have a chance to meet them tonight, I would encourage that. So, man, I'm just... I'm just thrilled you're here, uh, and like I said, just kind of selfish. I just feel like I wanted to, you just come hang out, and so yeah. we just get to hang out in front of everybody. So um, I, we do want to talk about uh, spiritual disciplines, which, which, is, which is a conversation that w- maybe a lot of us have been a part of at some point, and, and you know, uh, Lyle and I did a class uh, a couple Wednesday night quarters ago, and and that was really that was really exciting and encouraging for, for me. And uh, so th- it's it's not a brand new conversation around here, but but I still feel like there's there's a lot uh, to understand and to learn and to grow in uh, with us. I think tonight you'll you'll find here the entire spectrum of people who are man deeply in, invested in their disciplines and people that just think I I don't know it's just not 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 generally a part of my day or my week or my life you know so. Um, we got the whole spectrum here, but but just to start off, what are we talking about when we say spiritual disciplines? What do we even mean? What are, what are we what are we getting to? At? What are we what are we talking about? Well, I think first of all, it's good to just to note that spiritual disciplines or spiritual formation it's not something that's uh, new and catchy, and some people hear it and think, oh, isn't that that's got to be some new age kind of a strange mm-hmm. phenomenon? It's actually a really old. It's just the practices rooted in Scripture itself. But there's been a great emphasis in the last probably 15 years on spiritual disciplines. Richard Foster, Dallas, Dallas Willard are two authors that have really brought it back to the collective attention of Christendom. And there's just a lot of literature. There's a lot written uh, about them. So my, I do want to go to my, my favorite passage to describe at least what I think about when it comes to spiritual formation, is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to read this passage just, just as we get started. This is at the end of the chapter, Paul, he's been talking about Moses and the veil, using that Old Testament image. And at, towards the end, he talks about, he uses that as a metaphor to describe one's uh, relationship and transformative experience with the Lord. And so what he says is, We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. I think that's a super important 
passage in describing what we're talking about. One, because the heart of the verse says that what, what's happening is we're being transformed. So this is an ongoing process. There's really no end to it. We're, we're being transformed into the image of Christ. So you have this version of yourself. I have this version of myself. You have this version of yourself, which is so full of the Spirit, and it's so full of Christ that it functionally would be as if Jesus were actually embodying you fully and had full control over your thoughts and your actions and everything. That, that's the goal of, of spiritual formation, is, is to become as close as we can to the actual image of Christ living in us. That's what the, kind of the heart of the passage is about. But the beginning is really important. It says, we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. And so there you have to think about when, when Moses reflected upon God, there was something that got in the way. He couldn't, uh, or at least when the people looked at Moses, there was this veil that they couldn't see it fully. And for a lot of us, when we try to gaze upon the glory of Christ, well, there, there's some veil that gets in the way, whether that's a an overt sin. Sometimes that can just be you're just super busy. Uh, some, sometimes that can be a certain person in your life, an addiction, technology. But this verse is getting at if you can pull the veil away and just contemplate the glory of God. And, and all that word contemplate means is you, imagine you're uh, hiking up a mountain and you haven't really looked up in like 30 minutes and all of a sudden you stop and look out at the landscape and scenery, and you're just caught, and you just look at it. Well, that's, that's what contemplate means, just to gaze upon something. So, so what Paul is saying is when we can pull the, whatever your veil is away and just contemplate, just meditate upon, gaze upon this, the glory of God, then what happens is God actually starts to transform us from the inside out so that we become the image of Christ. So that's really the heart of spiritual formation is how do you go about removing the veil, and how do you contemplate? And once you do, it's not, it's not me that does the work. It's the yeah. Spirit. It, or Sorry, I'm talking a lot already, but one other way to think <laughs> about it is, so you guys remember two years ago when the big the, the eclipse phenomenon happened. Everybody was all fired up about that. How many of you got your glasses and went and looked at the eclipse? I, yeah, I went and looked my, at the... My family drove to Nebraska. We did you really? Yeah. yeah we to went. see like the, to, the Just, path we were of in totality? The full, we were in the, in the path of totality. There you go. We drove and... It I feel really cool knowing what that phrase means, the path of totality. The path of totality, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's pretty nerdy in that world. But That's it's, right. Yeah, but it's a... But if, but if you think about that, yeah. we, we all looked up at the sun, and we had to have the glasses. Because if you don't have the glasses, then the power of the sun will actually change something in your very being. Now, albeit a very negative change, you'd, you'd go <laughs> blind. But I think that analogy is right. If, yeah. When you look at the glory of Jesus, we often look at it with filters, and we don't let his power change us. But if we can take away the filter, then just the, the simple power of who he is starts to transform us from the inside out. So there's a lot of terminology that goes along with spiritual disciplines, and we'll get to some of those. And some of, the, some of that terminology we sort of associate with different things, and we'll talk about that some too. But, but really all we're talking about, whatever terminology we associate with it, Really, the, the final, the, the bottom line here is all the terminology we use in the conversation of spiritual disciplines are different ways to gaze at God. Yes. It's different ways to, to gaze upon His glory. Different ways to gaze upon His glory. And, I, and, and Foster has a pretty helpful metaphor, Richard Foster. He's, he says, he uses the plant metaphor. So a farmer wants the plant to grow. How does the farmer get the plant to grow? He doesn't grab a hold of the the, the, the stalk of the plant and squeeze it really hard and he doesn't rub the leaves together in his hands all the farmer can do is create the context in which growth is possible so he gives the plant water and he gives the plant sun but it's but it's really not up to him whether the plant grows he just creates the space for it that's what spiritual disciplines are i, I actually can't yeah. under my own power make myself grow into the image of christ but what I can do is I can adopt a set of practices, a set of disciplines, and these disciplines simply create the space in my own soul to allow God to do something that I can't do on my own. That, that's what a discipline is. So 
you sound like you've been involved in this for a little while. You've, you've been engaged with this for a while. Tell, tell us just a little bit of your background. How did you come to spiritual disciplines? What, you know, all of us were at some point, all of us were at some point in our life not doing spiritual disciplines. <laughs> Even if we are at a regular basis, uh, all of us were at some point not. So your journey, how, what was your journey leading up to? What led you to even have the desire to do these things? Um, I, I think everybody has their own story and their own journey. And for me, it was, it, it, for me, it, part of it started early on. Even, even as, a, as a kid, I, f- I did find myself just at least curious into who this God person was that everybody at church mm-hmm. talked about. Uh, my mom was getting her master's degree in early childhood development when I was three years old, and she had to do a research project, and so she actually uh, wrote down things I said in like a six-month period, and then she showed it to me as an adult, and, and I, w- I would say things as a three-year-old like, well, mom, does, does God have arms? And, uh, well, <laughs> well, mom, does, does God wear a sweater, and doesn't, <laughs> doesn't he get cold at night? And, <laughs> and so there was this even in, from an early age, there was this there was this fascination with who who is who is God and and how do we how do we get to know Him and and then I think my my parents really nurtured that growing up and and my grandparents and and uh, and church leaders and so I I felt like God placed the right people in my life just to nurture this curiosity and and so but then there was there was a I would say, a unique turning point specifically to my interest in the disciplines. And that, that was for me in grad school. I took a course on spiritual formation. We talked about a lot of what we're, we're talking about tonight. We read a lot of the, the spiritual classics, and, and I learned about what a lot of disciplines were, things like examine and Lectio Divina, um, a modern-day practice of Sabbath, silence, solitude, fasting, those kinds of things. And at the end of that class, the professor had us write a paper that he called it a, a rule of life, which was basically write down your plan for how you are going to practice disciplines in a, in a daily context, in a monthly context, in a yearly context. Like, what's, what's your plan? What are you going to do? And I remember writing that paper and, and I was, as, even as I was writing it, I, I thought to myself, you know, I, I've written a lot of papers in school, and most of them you just churn out to get the grade. But this one felt different because I had this desire to practice it. I, I wanted to do it. And so that was, that was in 2006. And so really, uh, I wouldn't say I've stuck to every sentence in that paper, but for the most part, I started practicing very regularly these, just these simple disciplines uh, in my life, and, and I would say that it's not that one practice, one time does a lot, but five or six years, 10 years, 13 years, yeah, that, that has a pretty, pretty big effect over time. Okay, so y- you said some phrases, um, meditation, uh, aren't these things kind of, don't we find the, the root of those more in like Buddhism and, and Hinduism and, and some of the Eastern religions, some, some of this Eastern, uh, Eastern philosophy, Eastern religion, ha, hasn't that influenced some of this? Is it safe to be practicing these things, I guess would be a, for a Christian who wants to continue to focus just on Christ uh, th- there's people who have who have associated these with with very unchristian, anti-Christian uh, philosophies and and groups. So how how do we balance uh, how safe this is for a Christian to be doing yeah. these disciplines? Yeah, I I taught a, a Wednesday night Bible class several years ago at my home church, and they whoever was organizing the class wanted me to actually talk about meditation for a whole class period. And I, I get up and start talking, and this lady towards the back just raises her hand, and she's like, what are you talking about? No, 
meditation is not from the Lord. Like, she almost thought of it as like a cuss word. Um, but there, <laughs> but even though that's an extreme reaction, that, that does uh, at least tell us that for some people, some of these words are a little odd, and, and meditate would be one of them. Some, some people assume, well, that, that's just Buddhist. And, but here, that's not necessarily true if you, if you think about it. So in, let's say, Islam, one of the five pillars of Islam is giving alms to the poor. Well, I've never heard someone say, well, giving is just pagan, because that's what they do. That's what the Muslims do. Mm -hmm. Because most people understand that giving is more of a means, not an end. So it's not necessarily the practice of giving itself that is holy or not holy. It's, well, what are you giving towards? And as Christians, Christian giving is we give to the local church, we, or we tithe, or, or we give uh, for the mission of God in the world. So we understand that giving is a means, not an end. And same with prayer. Hindu, Hindus pray. But we don't say that prayer is pagan because a Hindu prays. We just we know that prayer is a means. It's, it's one way we connect with God. And as Christians, we are, we are praying to the Judeo-Christian God, Yahweh, through Jesus Christ. That's He's, he's the goal. He's who we're praying towards. So I think you can apply the same train of thought to meditation. Medi there's nothing wrong with meditation. It's a means. You, right. you can meditate on, on anything. You, you, going back to the creation metaphor, if, you, if you're just struck by the glory of a sunset and you find yourself looking at it for a while, you're meditating. <laughs> meditating just means you, you take something in. You, it, it comes from, you, you probably, or some of you know this, but it, it comes from this word where the, the cow chews the cud, and so he eats the grass and regurgitates it and then throws it up and swallows it again. It's, it's a very gross word. I, I wish that didn't come from that, but that's, <laughs> that's what meditate means. It's just to take in something over and over and over again. So we do this when we look at a sunset. We do this when we gaze at a painting at a museum. We, we do this when we get swept away like the Don Miller illustration in jazz. That, that's a form of meditation. So Whereas Buddhism or Hindu meditation, the goal is detachment, and you want to uh, enter the void and uh, meditate upon nothing. Well, Christian meditation is you meditate upon Jesus, you meditate upon Christ, you meditate upon the Word. Go read Psalm 119. The, the longest chapter in the Bible is full of these phrases. Mm -hmm. I, I meditate on your Word day and, light, yeah. day and night. Your, your, yeah. you know, your Word is so rich to me. So meditation, we, we've got to demystify it or, or destigmatize it. It's a, it's a, it can be a Christian word. It's in the Bible, and it's a super useful practice yeah. as well. I like the, the correction you just made. Yourself. You said demystify yeah, it, but then, but then you changed destigmatize it. I think tonight I would love the stigma of the spiritual disciplines and meditation and things like this to be totally gone. But, I, and I struggle with this as well, how to, how to discuss this. We can't totally demystify yeah. this um, because there is a mystery to it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, ha so so how do we? It's not that it's not that we can do something that produces an automatic result, uh, and we know exactly what to do to get that result from God. It's a we put our coin and and we get the coke. It, it's not it's not that kind of transaction. Uh, how do you define sort of what that mystery is? Is, it, is there a way to, that you, is there a way, a, a vocabulary that you use to kind of describe that mystery? Well, I think one author I read, I like his definition of mystery. He says, mystery is not something that you can't know. Mystery is something that you can know infinitely. And that's what, that's who God is. He's mysterious, not in the sense that he doesn't want you to know him. He's he is mystery in the sense that you can know him infinitely. And so mm. when you think about spiritual disciplines, they help get us closer to this vast being that is God that we will never wrap our mind around. It, it, we, we, can just, we, we can just get close to it. And, and I think you have to also pay attention to the language of Scripture here. Like, for example, the prayer that Paul Faye prays in Ephesians 3 where he Remember this where he says that, I pray that you can grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses, you remember what he says? Surpasses 
Yeah, surpasses understanding, surpasses knowledge. So there's this sense in which I can't know. Like, my knowledge actually in its fullest capacity, if you take, you know, the 100 most brilliant people of all time, the, the Einsteins, and you put them all in one brain, even that brain is not advanced enough to ascertain the being of God. Right. And so, yeah, there, there is a mystery in there, but it's yeah. good. It's, it's full of love and gentleness. It's, it's not a scary yeah. mystery. Yeah, there's a, there's a Hebrew word that I forget how to, how to pronounce it. I certainly can't write it. Uh, but, but the word is translated in Scripture a couple times. It's translated wonderful. Hmm. Okay, so we, we look at the word wonderful, but you also look at other times in Scripture that that word is used, and, and you see phrases like, uh, too marvelous uh, for comprehension, too, too great to understand. It's, it's the word T-O-O. It's too, he's too much. As it, so this word in Scripture uh, points to the fact that there is, like you just described, there is this gap between where human beings' intellect ends and God's being begins. Uh, and so in that, there is a mystery of how we connect with Him. Uh, so, so these disciplines it are, I think, an amazing gift from God to allow us to connect with Him. Because if, if He allowed that mystery, to, to that gap to, to remain and never, never came across, never spanned the gap with His Son or His Spirit, then we would still be in the dark about the nature of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, just, just to get to your point, uh, and well, you, you know how Paul defines mystery? I believe it's, I think it's Colossians 2 where he talks about mystery a while and then he actually defines it. He says the mystery is Christ, Christ in you. in you. Yeah. That's the mystery. Somehow the being yeah. of Christ comes into the person. And so, so I want to be careful with language that we, we're, we're destigmatizing tonight. We're not demystifying because... To take away the mystery is to take is to limit the nature of God, um, but but I do think language is important um, and vocabulary is important. Um, you guys have probably known people that that you look up to that lived a sort of life that you would just love to to completely emulate. Um, a lot of you remember, and for us, you know, and, and we're along with lots of other people, um, and I didn't have, and I didn't have a plan to mention her name tonight, and her family's here. Linda Carr was, was one of these people for me that had a vocabulary that was, that was different, that was, you guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so, in your in your journey with spiritual disciplines, how have you how have you has your vocabulary changed in the ways you describe your own experiences with God, and, and how you're able to describe that to other people? First of all, I would say that I so I've I know I sometimes look like I'm 14, but <laughs> I've <laughs> I did uh, youth ministry for seven years and I've been preaching for seven years and. And then I've, I've, I've pursued my interest in this particular uh, area of study in, in a few ways. I, that class I told you about earlier, I also did a program out of Lipscomb, which, which helps train preachers in, uh, in the art of spiritual disciplines. And, so, and, I, and I've read uh, qu- quite a bit and, and just gotten to know people that are a lot farther on this spiritual journey than I am. And one thing that I found is re- really interesting is that different people describe their life with God with different words and phrases. So some people really resonate with words like obedience and providence. Um, other, other people use words like, it was a God thing, or God put this on my heart, or I feel like the Spirit might be moving me to... X. I had a conversation with a friend yesterday who was uh, pointing to the, a story that had just happened that he wouldn't, he, hadn't, he didn't tell me about the entire story, but, but he just, he just goes, yeah, it, it, it was, 
is one of those things. Oh, no words. That, just no, this. no <laughs> words. Just, just this is, is one of those things. And I, yeah. I thought that was actually really a really fitting way to describe. He was communicating that God had been involved in this <coughs> at, a, at a high level, and I can't even describe that. Just, <coughs> just one of these things. And so, yeah, we <laughs> lots of different ways that we used to describe yeah. our experiences with God. And I feel like because of that, one thing that that points to is there is this common human experience that we are trying to quantify and describe these deeper things that happen in the soul, and different people use different words for that. So one, I, I actually think in a sense the broadness of language is actually evidence of the reality itself. If we didn't have a thousand ways to describe it, we wouldn't really think it's happening, but because we do, something is going on. We're just we're scrambling for words, and I think it's really important not to belittle or judge someone because they describe their life with God with different terminology than you might describe your, your life with God. I, I think we need shared language. We, we need common ground. We need to give each other uh, the benefit of the doubt. I actually started writing down. So uh, let me say this also. I think we need to go to the words of Scripture. Here'd be a great exercise. Start reading your Bible and writing down every time an author in the Bible tries to describe something that is going on in his heart or in his soul or in his spirit. There's a lot of different phrases in Scripture, and that's where I think our language should come from. We should speak with the words of the Bible. And so I, started, I even started writing down the ways that different authors use uh, language, of, like language of the Spirit. I, I'm about to start preaching on Nehemiah. I'd never even thought about this till this week. In Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, Nehemiah says, God put this on my heart to rebuild the wall. I've always thought that, that phrase is kind of a modern romantic way. Uh, it's, it's not really in the Bible. We just say that. No, Nehemiah said that. God put this on my heart. So I think that's, that's a good one that we could use. Uh, Paul says, this grace was given me, meaning this, uh, that this calling from God to do something. He, in Paul's context, this grace was given to me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, that's another phrase. We don't use it a lot, but we could. It's, it's in the Bible. This, this grace was given me. Uh, the, word, the phrase in the spirit is used a lot. Philippians 4 is, you know, the peace that passes understanding. That's a, that's a good one to use. Paul multiple times talks about the inner being. He talks about it in Romans 7. He talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, Psalm uh, 139 um, it's that fearfully and wonderfully made psalm talks about it. So we, we have an inner being. Scripture uses that phrase. I think we can use that phrase. But uh, refresh my spirit. Uh, you, you brought me into a spacious place is a great phrase from the psalms. Deep calls to deep is in the psalms. So there's a lot of, and, and there's, there's, lang there's negative language too. And in the spiritual formation literature, you have consolation and desolation. Consolation are ways in which you can describe your life of God, life with God in which God is uh, bringing light to your soul and joy to your soul, consolation. Des desolation is more valley of the shadow of death kind of language. And, but there's language in the Bible of, of darkness and, and fear and e even Jesus in Gethsemane. My, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. So uh, spiritual formation is not just pie in the sky, butterflies and rainbows. There's also a uh, a darker way to talk about it, and it's mm. still God is still present within it. Mm. So anyway, that, that's a lot yeah. a lot to say, but there are different ways to talk about it. That's yeah. okay. Yeah, we should probably go to the Bible to find those phrases yeah. and give each other the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, well, there, I agree with that, but I want to be really careful here because uh, things like uh, I I felt it in my heart to do something. I've known lots of people that said that that probably shouldn't have done what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so how can, how, what's the best way that we can say, yeah, I, I, I have it on my heart to do something, um, and, and aren't our feelings, isn't, isn't kind of our heart, isn't our heart misleading sometimes, our, our heart is, is, is not complete, and it's, it can, it can mislead us, uh, in all kinds of ways, so, so in what ways, how can we trust what's going on inside of us to actually lead us into something that we know is of God? Yes, that is a really good question. How, how do I know if this is the Spirit leading me, and how do I know if this is indigestion from the salsa that I just ate? <laughs> yeah. So 
I, I think that's a good question. And uh, so a few thoughts on that. One, first of all, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament is uh, when Paul's going on his missionary journeys, he, he goes to Troas, and then he goes to Macedonia. He, that event is described actually two times in the New Testament. Luke talks about that journey in Acts chapter 16, and then Paul talks about that exact same trip in 2 Corinthians 2, and they talk about it very differently. So if you read Acts 16, the way that Luke describes this happening is Paul's in Troas, and he has a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so they get up and they go help the man. And that's where the origin of Philippi happened, the, the church. In 2 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about the same situation, and he doesn't mention the vision. All he says is, we went to Troas, couldn't find Titus, and I had no peace of mind. So we left and went to Macedonia. And I've always found that so interesting. Because if I had a vision, if, if I had this, you know, direct, miraculous, divine vision of a man saying, come to Macedonia, you better believe I'm going to write about that. Every time. Every time. But <laughs> Paul, when he's describing this event, the thing that he says pushed him over the edge to go was the lack of peace that he felt. And, he, and he's didn't go some places because he had a lack of peace. Yeah. As but, well. but he's paying, att he's paying attention. Yes. To, I didn't feel this peace in yes. Troas, so therefore I'm going yes. to Macedonia. All that to say, I don't think that we should discount our own experience as one factor in making decisions and living life. Now, I do think there's some qualifiers there, though. So this, is my, this, this next part is just my theory, my opinion. I think that if an individual has... You might picture like a river flowing uh, with, with two banks on either side. If, you, if, a, if a Christian has the boundaries of Bible and church family, I think that that Christian can trust and experience. So what I mean by that is if you've got an active Bible reading life and you're in the Word and you're wrestling with the Word and you're praying to God and you're really trying to work His will out in your life, Kind of imagine that as one side of a riverbank. And then on the other hand, on the other side, if you have a church community in which you're meeting with brothers and sisters in Christ and you're talking about your life and you're, you're being enriched by the fellowship of the body of Christ, those are significant boundaries. And that person, I think, should lean into their experience because they're not going to go off the deep end. Those boundaries are really strong. Bible and church, you're, you're not going to go off the deep end. I, I tend to think that those people, if they trust their experience, they're, they're going to go in the direction that God wants them to go. Even, there's a great second, uh, first John chapter 2. Let me just read this uh, passage. I was, I was meditating the other day on this section, and it's really not, never hit, never thought about this before. Um, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. So people are trying to pull his audience astray. As for you, the anointing you received from Jesus remains in you. You don't need anybody to teach you. It's kind of a scary thought. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, remain in him. Well, those words just jumped off the page, and it just, the thing that I pulled away from there was, I have to trust the anointing within me. Hmm. It's put there, the Spirit is put there to teach us all things. So again, if we have these boundaries in place, we should trust the anointing. And so if you, and kind of, I know I'm going on language limbs here, but different people describe that differently. Some people call it a spiritual intuition. Uh, some people call it just kind of your, your spiritual barometer. Trust that <laughs> if you have these boundaries in place. Now, if you don't, <laughs> I know a lot of people yeah. that they don't go to church, they're not reading their Bible, and they're just like, yeah, I'm just going to do whatever I feel. No, <laughs> do not do <laughs> what you feel. That's a really bad that idea. That's a terrible idea because yeah. you're going to end up doing something that's completely counter to the will of God. 
because you're not in the Word of God, and you're going to do something that's completely counter to the body of Christ because you're not in the body of Christ. And, and even think about the difference between a flood and a river. A river is very helpful because there's boundaries, and a flood is very destructive because there's no boundaries. I think it's identical with experience. Mm. Experience is powerful when there's boundaries. Experience is destructive when there's no boundaries. Wow. That's, I just want to put that little sound bite in your pocket, and that's, if, if you don't leave with anything else, that's, that's good enough for me tonight. Um, I, oh, man. That was so good, I forgot kind of what I was gonna, <laughs> where I was going to go. Um, I'll get the saxophone. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but, but I think you're right. I think th- we, we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, very biblical language, uh, but, but we kind of shy away from that we could have an experience in, an, in ourselves that would lead us to something godly, like... like how else is the Holy Spirit going to communicate with us? Yeah, yes, through the Scripture, and yes, through our church community, um, but, but to say that we're not ever going to have, you're never going to feel something in your heart that God wants you to do, mm-hmm. that's, that's not Bible. Um, and so, yeah, I, I want us to get t- continue, uh, sorry, I want us to continue to lean into these things and lean into your community, lean into the Word of God, so that when you do have these experiences, you know, I can, I can trust that, and I can follow that, and I can obey that. And, and a church community that finds itself doing that, I think w- would revolutionize certainly a church, but also the city that that church is in, of a group of people who are really paying attention to what God wants me to do right now today. That, that's what changes the masses. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that, you know, one thing that pe- makes people nervous is if I really, let, let's say, if, that, if so-and-so over there really trusts the Spirit and really follows the Spirit, well, what's that really going to lead to? Well, the skeptic over here thinks, well, I, I don't know about that. That's, you know, all those liberals over there doing that weird thing. I don't know about that. Well, that's not a great way to think about the result. Here's how you know that the Spirit has been at work in you or somebody else. It's going to be crazy when I say this here. You're going to see more love and joy and And peace. peace. Say them with me. And patience, patience kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Not some amazing experience where I just felt so amazing. It was awesome. I got goosebumps. Okay, you might have, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. But did you yell at the person in front of you in the car on the way home? That's right. Yeah. So I I think it's a lot more normal. Like, yes, the Spirit's there when we worship, but the Spirit's there when we stack the chairs before worship, too. Like, Spirit's in all things. Like, uh, one of my my anchor memories for spiritual disciplines is I was on a trip, church trip, and uh, I was going off by myself to find a place to just read my Bible and pray for a little while. And I I passed this person that I don't dislike the person, but he's he's not my favorite person. He's kind of annoying. And uh, so... (laughs) I remember seeing him and thinking, oh, I don't want to talk to so-and-so. So I actually changed my path and walked, you know, like the, the, the priest and the Levite and the Good Samaritan. I just, you know, blatant sin. I just, <laughs> I avoided the guy because I didn't want to talk to him. And then I go off in the woods and spend 15, 20 minutes uh, praying and reading Scripture. And uh, I remember I was in a passage about love, just meditating on well, 20 minutes later, I, I get up, and I'm walking back, and I see the same guy walking. And I had this immense change in my heart towards him. Mm. And before I even, I did walk up to him, but before I walked up to him, and I'm not that emotional of a guy at all. Like, I'm not one of those kind of weird, touchy-feely guys, but I just started welling up with tears because I was seeing him the way that God sees him, and God loves him. And the reason I felt that way is simply because I'd spent 15 to 20 minutes with God. And back to the very first verse, when you gaze upon the glory of God, he, he transforms you. Yeah. And so I, I, that's all it did. I just loved the man. Yeah. And he, actually, I did, I did go up to him, and I was, I was, I was like really emotional. I'm, I'm sure he thought he was really, really weird. 
Uh, I think this is how pregnant ladies feel. They just cry all the time, and they don't know why. But, <laughs> but it was. It was, it was a, so I always go back to that when I, when I want to remember how the disciplines work. That's how they work. You spend time with God, God, and you create space, and then the Spirit does something in your heart that you can't do on your own. Yeah. What are, real quick, what are, what are one or two of your favorite disciplines that you have gotten a lot of benefit out of? My favorite is, the fancy word for it is Lectio Divina. It's Latin for divine reading. But what the, is Lectio Divina? The, that doesn't sound fancy. The non-fancy version. It's just, it's a, it's a little different way to read the Bible. Um, you read it one small section at a time, and especially when you're in narrative, when you're in the Gospels or Acts, you, so I'll, I'll, I'll sit in silence for five or six minutes just breathing deeply and trying to clear my mind, and then I'll read a short section of the Bible, and then I will close my eyes, and I will meditate just on that story, almost like you, uh, like a movie director, and I'm actually painting the scene in my mind, and I, I'm seeing characters, and I'm actually looking up and seeing what the sky looks like in the city landscape, and I'm seeing Jesus, and I'm seeing the people interacting with Jesus, and I, I kind of, with all my senses, enter, enter into that story, and then just sit there and pay attention to kind of what parts of the story strike me. I did this just a few days ago. I was, I'm reading through John right now, and I got to 13, and man, it's pretty powerful to do foot washing. Mm. Just, you, you put yourself in that story, and if you really sit with it a while, and you know, imagine you're one of the people and Jesus washed your feet and uh, it's just meditation. Yeah. And so, so I'll do that for, for several minutes and then towards, towards the end, I'll just, I'll just pray. I'll say, God, what do you want me to know? Yeah. Or what do you want me to do? Yeah. And I'll just sit there. I've heard Lectio Divina described as instead of reading for in, information, it's reading for transformation. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. reading to, not so you can yeah. master the word, so the word can master you. Yeah you're inserting yourself under the authority and power of the text and attempting to let the text penetrate you from, yeah. from the inside out. Yeah. So that's my favorite is Lectio Divina. And then what I, what I try to do is that when I come out of that time is to take one phrase, one thought, one idea, and then let it, let it carry through the rest of the day. Hmm. And that, man, that, that's a really powerful experience too because yeah. I'm often called back to that, uh, to, to that moment when I was with Scripture and, I, and I'll come come back to it later, yeah. later yeah. in the day. Like this morning, it was, uh, I'm in John 14 now, and Jesus says, um, I'm going to send you the counselor of the Holy Spirit. The world will not know him. And then this is what really caught me this morning. You will know him because he lives in you. So that's what I took with mm. me today. Mm. You will know him because he lives in you. And that's kind of, that's just anchored my day. Were there any, any practical things that 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 played out in that uh, manifested that that thought kind of manifested in in a specific instance of love or joy or peace or any of these any of these fruits of the spirit for you today. I, that's putting you on the spot for a, for one well, one day. Actually, let me. That's a, I, I have no answer to that yet. <laughs> However, <coughs> another discipline that I've found really helpful is the discipline called examine. Mm -hmm. So I might be able to answer your question later tonight. Sure, sure. Examine is an ancient discipline. People have been practicing it for um, a long, long time, and it's, it's best practiced at the end of the day. And the way I do it is I have a journal, and um, I will close my eyes and replay the last 16 hours. And I'll think about the people I talked to, emails I sent, interactions with kids, and I will ask two questions. Number one, where did I respond to your spirit? And number two, where did I resist your spirit? And so I really just go over the day gently in the presence of Christ. And that's really, really helpful um, because on the one hand, it, it does make me aware of the, my moments where I, I was completely living for myself. And then it also makes me aware in a healthy way of, you know what? I, I actually think I responded to the Spirit there, and the Lord used me. And those are good. Those are good moments to acknowledge that God, God is working. So I, I, I try not to let that experience be a guilt trip, but more of just a, a learning how to live life what, you know, one day at a time. Yeah. This one verse I was going to mention earlier, Luke 640, super crystal clear 
sentence on spiritual formation. A disciple, when he is fully trained, will look like his master. That, that's what it is. A disciple, when he's fully trained, will look like his master. So Lectio, I, I try to do that most mornings. Exam, and I, tr- I try to do that most evenings. Give us two pieces of advice for somebody that just is here tonight and just says, I just want to take one step in the right direction of, of living a life that is not with any specific discipline necessarily, but, but I want to live a life more in line with the Spirit, more uh, looking like Jesus, more acting like Jesus. I want to take a step in the right direction. What's one or two pieces of advice you have for that? And we're running pretty much out of time. Well, so I, I would, <laughs> I really number one, I would say this. give yourself some credit. A church attendance is a spiritual discipline. Mm. It's a vital spiritual discipline, which right. has an enormous, enormous influence over the course of our life. So a lot of us are already practicing that. Uh, worship is a spiritual discipline. Reading your Bible is a spiritual discipline. So one, sometimes people sit through retreats or l- seminars on this, and they feel guilty. Oh, I'm a terrible person. No, you're not. Just give yourself credit. You're already doing a lot of these things. That, that's what I'd say is number one. And then number two, if you wanted to just try something. Here's what I would try. I would read the prayer from Ephesians 3 every day for one week, and I would try to make it your prayer, like the, like the prayer in which you carry it throughout your day. Um, just as one way to start, start into the disciplines, if I could find Ephesians Okay, look, Can I read that? Look, at, look at Ephesians 3. I, this is what we'll do. Okay. Why don't you close us in just a minute with that yes, prayer? Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Um, the, th- the thing that I, was, that I wanted to bring Phil here for tonight um, is, is Phil, has, Phil has two things that, um, that I think we all look up to him for. One, he, he's a great communicator. Well, there's a lot to think. I, I can go on and on. <laughs> um, but Phil has a desire to know the Lord and to be transformed into the image of his son. Before we can do anything else, there has to be born in us this desire But as you go into this, instead of maybe, maybe one of your first steps tonight is asking God for the desire to be able to engage in these activities so that they can change you. Um, a lot of us don't practice these, not because we're, we run out of time, we, we really want to, we just don't get to us. Some of us, like my, like my lack of desire to practice piano, we kind of have this lack of desire to practice these things. So maybe the first thing we, we do tonight when we go home is pray to God, God, help me grow a desire within myself to know you more. And from that, from that moment, we'll stem a life that, may, like I said, may not have It may not be a roller coaster, but you will find yourself exhibiting more love and joy and peace and on and on. I'm going to have Phil read that prayer in just a second. Phil, I'm really, really grateful and thankful that you were able to be here with us tonight. Let's give Phil just a, 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 a thank you. And, yeah, and as, for a, having as me. a show of good faith or as of like ownership, you're, you're one of us. Now here's a park t-shirt. Mm. Um, so you are, you are officially one of us. Uh, wow. thank you for, thank you for being here. Wow, uh, if you, so if you need to house hunt in Tulsa, just let me know. And we'll, um, we, we've got some people to take care of you around here, even somebody in the room tonight. So, huh. um, so uh, thank you for being here tonight. Greatly appreciate it. Love you very much. Close us out within a prayer from, Fe- from I will. Ephesians thanks, 3. Thanks for having me. I, Mitch and I have been talking about doing me coming up here, so probably in 2020 yeah. I, I hope I can be up here again and spend, yeah. spend some time with, with you all. And, and what you said is right at the end. Sometimes it's just 
I want to want yeah. God. And that's, that's okay. That's a yeah. great place to start. Okay, let's, let's bow it. I'll, I'll, I'll make this the theme of, this, of our, our final prayer here. Father, we come before you and we praise you as the God of the heavens, the God from whom every family of believers derives its name. We pray that out of your glorious riches, you can strengthen us with power through your Holy Spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And we pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of your holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of your glory. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Thanks for being here tonight. You're dismissed.